What's going on, everybody? Hey, we're back. Thank you so much for being here. I'm here with the one and only Coach Caduti. Coach, I appreciate you being here. Uh, what You had a phenomenal year this year. What sure. is some key takeaways from this year? And then we will get into it. I'm a little rusty, so we'll, let's just talk, baby. Absolutely. No, 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 no. Um, so, you know, we went 11 and one, uh, first time in school history. So we went, uh, you know, it's one of those years. So I took over this job um, three years ago, right? So three years ago, I took over this place and it was a, uh, I think they won like seven games, three or four years. It's only, the program is only four years old. School is, uh, we're the fast growing school in the state. Uh, so when I took the job three years ago, we had six. 1600 kids i think and now we have 3400 something like that um and so the growth is here but it's um you know but that includes you have to play bigger schools so but so we had a good year um they had never made the playoffs my first year here we went uh six and five made the playoffs went one round deep uh drove seven hours to get our asses handed to us 48 to 14. <laughs> uh, but we made the playoffs you thought we could have ran for mayor here at Folster, texas and then um the next year, we actually moved up a classification, and we got put into what uh, some people in Texas called the SEC West. Um, so we got put in a district where there's nine of us, and seven of the teams had made it to three rounds or deeper uh, the year before. And so I uh, didn't know what was going to happen. We ended up going 11-2 uh, and two and going three rounds, man, in one of the districts. And so uh, this year, we actually replaced all five O-linemen, uh, the quarterback, two receivers, uh, three D linemen, two safeties, you name it, we, we did it. And, uh, actually went 10 and 0 in the regular season, man, in the same district. Um, in fact, here's a, here's a statistic for you this year that blew my mind. I didn't realize this during the entire season, regular season, we only trailed for one minute and 12 seconds, the entire season. Hang on. And it was the first drive of the first game of the year. We, uh, we, we snapped a snap the ball, hit the freaking kid. Safety. We were down two nothing. That was the only deficit we were in all year until we lost in the playoffs. <laughs> that is nice. And we're going to touch on some of the things that you've been doing this year because I know I've been following you from afar and you've been doing some different things within the wide zone category and offense because you are one of the, the gurus when it comes to the wide zone. But I would like to talk about how you built your program up because you, you, you do a phenomenal job. I don't know if any other coaches do this in Texas or whatever, but your social media presence oh. is unbelievable building your program. And I want to kind of touch on that first. Is that something you went in knowing you were going to do once you got there? Or is that something that you kind of stumbled upon and then realized it was working and, and went all in on it? You know, really, man, I think it boils down to a couple of things. You know, number one, you know, I think that people need to understand that, in today's world, it's, it's social media, it's marketing. It, it's when you take over a football program or an athletic department, it's a business. So no matter how we look at this, it's a business. And so we have a business plan. And so when I've, you know, through the years I've kind of developed a business plan that I have that I, I go through and I, and I determine, you know, this is what we need to do step by step. And so, you know, for me, the first thing we do is we look at it and we, we figure out what's going on in, in, in the, the program and we say, okay, you know, What's the buzzword everybody talks about when they talk about an organization, right? They usually say what? What culture, right? Yeah. You know, what's the culture? The culture is bad. The culture is great. You know, and so the first thing we do is we, we man, you got to define that. What is a culture? And so for us, and so for me, I, I was like, you know, we have to define this. I have to have my own definition, right? The reality of it is it's what's acceptable, what's unacceptable, what's important, what's unimportant, you know, right, wrong, workable, unworkable, you know, beliefs, not whatever. That's what it is. To me, what culture is, is when I walk into your field house, on your field, in your gym, in your classroom, in your home, what I see and what I hear, that's your culture. And so for us, it was about, you know, I want people to walk into my weight room and know exactly who we are, exactly what we stand for, and so I had to create this idea with my staff. And so when cultures are built, they're built two different ways, bro. And one, it's either through consideration and intent or by contrast, it just comes together, you know, naturally. And so you got two choices as a coach. You are either going to let things happen on their own or 
you're going to be super conscious and be very intentional in everything that you do. And that was our whole goal. And so for me, the first thing we had to do is we had a marketplace, right? So we have to market it. And so when we talk about, when we talk about building a program and we talk about, you have to market your program. And so the first thing we did was we had to define what that was and we had to sell it. Right. And so for us, I came in and we came up with the dirty F. Yes. Right? I see culture. that everywhere. Yeah. And you got, we have a hand sign, but it was, you know, it was something that drive with the kids because when I rolled in the door, my first spring, you know, there's another school in our district who we split from called Foster High School, who is the home of CD Land, by the way. Um, he, they basically, they've always run this district. And so we were the, the rejects from Foster. So when I got here, we we're the rejects. We were the other side of the tracks. We were the other school with the F. And so we were the dirty F, right? And so we just kind of ran with it, bro. And so it kind of became this idea and we hashtag it. And, you know, and my other thing is when we talk about social media, man, at the end of the day, it ain't about me and you. It's about these mm -hmm. kids, right? Yeah. And it's about what these parents want to have their kids to have this enjoyable experience. And, you know, if you have a social media presence and you just sell the crap out of your kids and you talk about the greatest part of what this program is, that's what people see. People are going to see what you want them to see. And that's what social media is for. It's for you to show off the best parts of your program. And so that was our goal. We came in knowing exactly what we wanted to do. And that's that's beautiful. Now, coaches, if you have any questions, put them in because I saw a good one for right here. And how did you get admin to buy in? Because I have known a lot of coaches talk to them. They want to do something similar to what you've done, but the admin has has not really gone in with it, kind of pushed back and stuff like that. Did you have that experience? And if so, how did you get around that? Really, man, it, it, you're going to have fight. You're going to have kickback. And no matter what you do, you're always going to have kickback. And so we had kickback on it because the old guard, right? The old guard wanted kickback and it doesn't make, you know, it doesn't make us sound good. It makes us sound, you know, like we're shady. And the reality of it was it's not about you and I, it's about the kids. And I, what I did was I made sure, and I posted on social media, what it stands for, like the dirty F, what does it stand for? And I told the story of finding a rallying cry of our kids. So even in your own mind, man, if you have this, like, I'm going to test the lines and borders, you better be able to back it up, right? Why am I doing this? And so for me, that's what I did. It was like, okay, I'm going to get kickback. But I got to find the right people that are bought into what we're doing and still do right by the kids. So even though we go the dirty F, you know, we're still out in the community. Like and I make sure people know, bro, we go Christmas shopping for kids, you know, the Christmas, the, the tree of giving or whatever. And I guarantee most of the coaches on here do this already. But the difference is I film it. I make it like a yeah. documentary and I send it to the news and they post Ooh, it on smart. the news. And so all of a sudden the dirty F. Man, they're doing things for the for the school, the program, the community. You know, this isn't this isn't a bad thing. They're just doing their thing. It's what they do. And so that's how you get people bought in is do things right. You don't have to be a jerk and stay a jerk. You know, me, I'm just an arrogant prick, but I'm a lovable arrogant prick. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> now, okay. I love that. I didn't even think about putting things to the news because I see you posted on Twitter and your Facebook and your Instagram and stuff like that. But the news, that's a nice little thing. So coaches, when you're watching the, to, uh, write that down. Another one. Did you see an influx of kids? Because uh, Coach Sonny right here, how do you get the best kids in your school? Did you see once you implemented the social media and stuff like that, like more kids were coming out? Because your program has grown, even though – I know a lot of places that are really big po school student population, but they have a really small football team. Did you see yeah. the social media aspect grow your team like that? Oh, hundred percent. You know, and so the other thing, man, is like, you know, when you have to market this, so you have to market to your own school, you have to market it to your own, like everybody. And so for me, I was willing to spend money in my own pocket to buy t-shirts for our kids to, you know, I, man, I'm telling you, I flood our community and our school with t-shirts and hats and I give it away. Like, Hey, for $2, I'll give you a t-shirt, right? I don't give a crap, whatever. But the idea is I'm going to flood you so much. I'm going to just literally slap you in the face with the dirty F with vulture football so much that you have no choice, but to buy into what we're doing. And you talk about how you get those kids out. 
Well, the best salesmen in your school are your own kids. If mm -hmm. your kids tell the other kids, bro, we are having a blast. Those kids are going to want to be a part of it. So not this year, but the year before, one of my running backs, I had a running back come out. He was in the hallway. He had moved in like a year and a half before, didn't play ball, looked fairly athletic. He's like, coach, I want to play ball. I was like, come on, man, let's go. What do you, what do you play? I don't even know, coach. Dude ended up running for 1,400 yards. Just got him out of the hallway, man, like just a dude, like a little, little kid, man, tatted up, but he could go, right? But he was one of those kids. He just wanted to be a part of something, and we gave them something to be a part of, man. There's a reason why religion is a real thing. You give people something to believe in. 100%. And then also, you're, I know Christmas, you did like a pancake thing that you posted up. I love that. Love pancakes, by the way. But uh, how do you come up with these ideas? Is there, do you talk to other coaches or is this something in the middle of the night you pop up and you're like, oh, that's a great idea? Because I know some coaches struggle trying to come up with these types of things to get buy in. Hey, Rob, Barter, and Steel, man. So, Really, you know, when I go to Glazier Clinic and speak, one of my favorite things to do is to, if I'm not on one of the panels, is to listen to those panels. Just guys, like basically roundtable talking about things to do, right? Like, hey, this is what we do to make our program better. Like, I got something. I personally write a letter to every person in our athletic department, okay? Every That's kid nice. for their birthday. And I, I send it out every Sunday. I send them out and I hand write a letter and mail it to them. It, and it's just like, hey, happy birthday from Coach Kennedy, man. Glad you're part of the program. That's it. But something as simple as that has gotten people, like parents have walked up to me and said, my son has had this for two years. Thank you. Right? Stuff like that. The pancake thing was, it was Christmas time. And I said, you know what? I'm going to make pancakes with our coaching staff with the entire for the entire staff. All of our teachers, our faculty, I'm making pancakes for everybody and we're going to go in and we're going to have a hoot time doing it. We're going to make, we're going to act a fool, you know, and, and it's just one of those things where you just go out and you have to be willing to look stupid. Right. Like, bro, I make think about this. My tick, I, we make TikToks with my staff this year, my kids. Yeah. And, and like, it's just fun. And I look like an idiot. Right. And I do popcorn reviews at all the schools, which I, I love by the way. Oh, well, because guess what? How many schools do you guys go as coaches? Go to the go to go to schools to scout games, and you, you know, you're always eating popcorn or your BS, and you always talk about the stadium. So I pop do a popcorn review at every stadium I go to with my coaches. Oh, we go to seven point five or whatever. But you're making yourself, you're throwing yourself out, dude. I've had people on message boards rip me apart. You need to be worried about coaching ball instead of doing popcorn reviews. Maybe this time, maybe next time he'll. He'll be coaching ball instead of, you know, instead of being a, making TikToks. Well, you know what, bro? At the end of the day, my kids love it. They have a blast. And we're, dude, we're, we're having a great time at Fulcher. What about you guys sitting at home doing nothing? Shots fired. I wish I had a soundboard with the thing. <laughs> and that ties into a, another one. Because this is, I don't hide from things. What do you do with the kids that aren't a stud? But I'm guessing that those people are still worthwhile in your program. And they are helping you build the uh, the culture that you need and everything. It's not just like, because we both we all know coaches that are like, yeah. hey, studs get one thing, people get the other. How do you address that if that ever comes up? So, and really, this is kind of a deal. Like, so we're the only program that plays. So I we played twelve games year thirteen last year. We're the only team that didn't have a Division one football player. So Damn. I don't really have studs. I have good football, high school football players that give a crap, that care about each other. And so what we found was as long as you give kids ownership and make them understand that there's a role for them. So my philosophy is you play until you're a senior. I'm going to guarantee you playing time. Now, down here, I have, we've got a boatload of kids. I got a boatload of kids, right? When I first took the job, I had 74 kids, 9 through 12. Next year, I'm going to have 361. OK, but it doesn't matter. You're going to play. If you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, you're going to get reps. I don't even care if I have to make two JV teams and you're a running back playing left tackle. You're going to get in the game. You're going to play because that's how you get better. But getting those kids to understand that they are a part of this program, like we reward those kids. And so for me, I'm a big O-line guy. So we reward our O-line. 
Our O line has their own shirts. Our O line eats first. Our O line gets to sit alone on the bus. Our O line doesn't do conditioning. Our O line, but I'm telling you right now, but when you go to practice, I'm MF and some I'm MF some alignment. Okay, I'm getting in, I'm getting all up in it. But I also treat them like kings. But I make it known to our kids this is why they're treated like kings. And so you talk about what do you do with the kids that weren't studs? So I want you to think about this. When you build a program, okay, and you create a culture, to me, it's a five-part process. Number one, you have to define what you want. Okay. That way everyone's on the same page. Number two, you have to teach what you want and you have to teach it consistently because if you teach something consistently over and over and over, it will become reality. Number three, you have to live it. Okay. As a coach, if I want my kids to show up on time, my coaches better be on time. If I want you wearing a red shirt, you all better be wearing a red shirt. This is a critical for the leaders of an organization so that people underneath them see you that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? The next thing is you measure it, whatever that standard might be. You're on time. This is our kids that are on time, yada, yada, yada. And the last thing is you got to be rewarded. So instead of punishing negative behavior, reward the positive. Champion the behaviors you want. And a lot of those kids who aren't studs in my program, they get the recognition of being dudes. So when we go out to captains at, at like a 50 yard line, if you're a guy who's bought in and doing things the right way, even if you're not a starter, you're on the you're on the 50 yard line doing the coin flip because you did things the right way. And that's how you get bought in. That that's incredible, man. I love the five points. Again, coaches write this down. He's I don't even coach now, and I'm I'm writing this down. This is this is great. So, coaches, if you're just joining us, I'm here with the man, the myth, the legend, Coach Caduti. We're talking about building programs, and then we're about to talk about the wide zone and everything like that. If you have any questions that you want uh, answered, go ahead and put them in the chat. If you haven't already, if you like this, you're finding it valuable, give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you're not already. So, uh, when you going back to the culture and then the buy-in with the admin and stuff like that, did you, was that something you presented in the interview process or was that something you held back until you got the job and you knew who you had to talk to or was that something that you learned as you were on the job all right so you have to understand like you don't know like everyone rolls up in the door with their core beliefs right like these are my core beliefs well let's get real most of those core beliefs are pretty stereotypical right you know, well, we're going to do things the right way. Get the hell out of here, bro. Like, you need to find out what works for you and what works for your kids. Everyone's different. The reason people fail is because they, they try to emulate what everyone else does. And so, for me, I came into a program, and, and I got to the point, I was like, you're going to like me for who I am, and you're going to accept me. I'm not doing things cookie cutter. And I'm going to do things my way because at the end of the day, as a coach, you know, as well as I do, you're either getting fired or you're going to get fired. Right. Yeah. And so if you're going to do it, you might as well do it your way. And that's my, my thought. So when I go to the, when I go into interviews and stuff like that, I, I explain to them that, you know, I'm going to push boundaries, but at the end of the day, I build things on three things, character, right? Our coach are going to be good people Two, connection. Can you relate to kids? Because this is a kid centered business. And if we are not relating to kids, we are failing. And the last thing is competency. Brother, I can teach ball, but I can't okay. teach a 40 year old man to be a good, be a good man. And so for me, those three things are what I build my belief on. And so what we do is we find our values. If this tells you anything about us, okay, I let my captain's group who now may I tell you how I do that's a whole different process. They are the ones that came up with our core values and our core values. They're very gray, but they all have a meaning and a belief. Our are you ready for our four values? They're the dirty yes. FUs. Okay. <laughs> we are unique. Okay. Sure. Unyielding. Unlikable. All right. And united. And we're all for those. And our kids have to teach to the other kids why we are those four things. And that's what we believe in. And it took me a year and a half to come up with those core beliefs. 
And so have I told my, have I told my administration, these are my core beliefs? No, but they're just, our, they're, these are our four U's, <laughs> but there are, there are four F's, the full sure you, <laughs> right? And so it's really like, how do I toe the line of being crazy, but at the same time do things the right way? And that's where you have to do it. I'm going to tell you this. And if you listen to this, con- if you listen to this podcast and or whatever you I need you to listen to one thing. Everyone does the job, but are they going to do it like you? And how are you different than everybody else? That's the difference. Like yep. I can do my job, but there's not a single person that's going to do it like me. You're right. And that's, I, I, I love how you take business principles. Cause I know you read a lot. And you put it into the football aspect of things because, you know, unique, the, your unique selling proposition in business is what also you have to do to your program, what makes you unique and why should people come to play with you, work with you, uh, support you and everything like that. Have you always been that way or is this something you learn throughout your reading and your coaching journey? Well, man, really, it goes back to taking everything that you've done and being like, okay, what's worked, what hasn't. And then, you know, I remember, man, I remember when I had just got done playing ball, I was emailing, writing letters, knocking on, dude, I would do anything for a GA job. You know, I would do a part time stipend assistant, da 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 da. Man, I would do anything, you know, and I just remember I finally had a phone call back from Bill Snyder, right? Because he graduated from William Jewell. Hey, go cards. Um, Dan, La- Dan Lanning was on our football team. Just saying. Dan was my college teammate. And, nice. but like it was, he said, you know, hey, I really appreciate you reaching out. Da, 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 da. And he asked me something. He said, what, what, why should I hire you? Uh, I don't know. Because I work hard. You know, I got sweet hair. Yes, you do. But, but that's what I'm saying. It's it's the situation of I had to learn you have to be different. When I came to the state of Texas, I'm not a Texas guy. Um, and so I'm not a part of the boys club and there is a boys club down here, man. And so you guys are, if you're in Texas, listen to this, I'm sure you are. It's hard to break in, you know, and you have to make a niche for yourself. And I found my niche man, and, and I'm willing to step on toes and, and I'm willing to push some boundaries, right. To become what I want to become, but it's over time, right? It's reading. It's the things that make you better in life. Like right now, this is my book. This is my read right now. The daily dad, you know, and it's a great one, man. It's a great book, but it's like you said, man, Mac, it, it, you have to better yourself every day. So yeah. I agree. We can't preach to our kids to get better every time. 1% better. If we ourselves aren't, doing the same thing. We've got to lead by example. And I like that you're doing that. Also, I'm a big fan of Ryan holiday stoicism. Oh yeah. So that's great. Okay. So if I was a new coach and you're, you're helping me and I'm coming in and I'm going to be first year head coach or whatever, just like you, what are like three things I should work on? Because I know that we come in with a whole list of things, but let's simplify it to three because you're not going to get through that whole entire list. What are the three most important things to you that you think first time head coaches or head coaches going to a new job. If okay. they want to build a program, they should focus on 98% of good coaches leave good jobs because of what parents. Yeah. So the first thing you've got to do is you've got to get parents on your side. You have to over communicate to your parents. I need you to be organized. If you are not organized, hire somebody that is brother. I am the least organized person on earth. Look at my office behind me. It's a disaster, but I'm, I'm a, I'm an idea guy. You know, I, I'm, I'm that guy, but I'm not the guy who's going to sit and do paperwork. I'm terrible at making communication. So I have to hire somebody who is good at what I'm not. That is your number one thing. Hire somebody who's good at what you're not good at. Number two, okay, is idea and figure this out. Find out who you are and who you want to be and stand firmly with what you want to be. Don't let people try to tell you how to do your job, but at the same time, be willing to listen to people that know more than you that are trying to help you. There's a difference between somebody just being an a-hole and somebody who's genuinely trying to help you know the difference, but you've still got to have an identity. And lastly, I would tell people all the time is number one, 
is this over communicate to your kids over communicate to your parents over communicate to your admin because if you over communicate everything that happens the things that come down the line it was always hey i'll let you know but this ended up happening and nobody can get mad that you over communicated with them the biggest issue is and i believe the great movie quote what we have here is a failure to communicate <laughs> And that is a true statement. And I think that will solve so many of your problems. Okay. So communicate. Do you like email? Do you have like an email newsletter or something like that? Do you, are you constantly texting? Like, how do you communicate like that so that everybody well, is kind of so, on the same page? I have, so during the season, I have a weekly schedule. I mean, I'm talking down to the minute of what we're doing, where we're going, what we're going to be at, what we're in. And my practice schedules are posted on the on the walls in here and then they're also put out online to parents through a sports u app which is like an app where they can get on um i have a i have coaches so what i've done is delegate responsibilities to people that's another thing i would tell you to do and so each one of my coaches has a position group and they are the leader of that position group so i don't have to go tell people i tell my coaches this is what's happening i need you to do this and guess what they do they do this and so hey like today, I sent it out. Hey, guys, I need you to tell the guys, make sure they have their white shirts, black shorts, cleats, and flats for tomorrow. I just sent it to the coaches. The coach's job is to send it to their group. And I know that if a kid in a group did not get the message, it's because the coach failed. Okay. I like that. And then also you're giving – you're building up the coaches uh -huh. as well to start working and maybe – because I know you – My job is to build coaches to be head coaches. Yeah. So since I've been here, okay, since I've been here – I have three head coaches that have, I have three coaches left that are now head coaches in Texas. I have five position coaches that are now coordinators. My job is to help you get better. If you're staying here for years and years and years, I have failed you, right? And it's my job to help you grow and get better and do things that you normally wouldn't be able to do just being an assistant coach. So like each one of my coaches has, like I have a responsibility list and people talk about, dude, I'm telling you like, if I give you a responsibility, I say, hey, you do it. What do you need from me to get it done? Other than that, I'm not stepping your toes. And when you do it, you better not get mad if they don't do it the way you want it done. Right? I like, like I have an elementary liaison. And his job is to make sure, and I give him a, like a parameter, hey, I want to be at the elementary this much, and I want a communication built, and I want a community built with the elementary kids. Tell me what I, what you need from me. And they do, and they run with it. And guess what? We look like, we look like world leaders because that's his main responsibility where I would have 15 minutes in a day to do it. He's got hours. Yeah. And so he's probably going to do a better job than me. So that's that two things. One, you're giving the other coach responsibility. And when it does well, he feels good. Like, Oh, the head coach is actually listening to me and being of service to me instead of the other way around. And then two, you were building connections with the elementary. So by the time they grow and are coming to the high school, they already know you, they already know what the program's about and they're excited to actually play for you. Correct. Oh yeah. It's, it it's a, again, it's a business plan, right? Like I, this is where I need to be. I need to be here. I need to do this. I need this. Okay. How are we gonna make it happen? I like it. All right. Now we're going to, this is a, a really awkward segue, but you said, the four things, you know, you got to know who you are. You offensively are a wide zone guy. Yes, sir. And that's kind of how you've built a name other than being an incredibly good looking dude with great hair and a great coach in the offensive space, the wide zone. Um, are you seeing now this is your third year, fourth year? This is At, my third season you're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Third year. Have you seen the progression of the wide zone the players are getting it every like they've kind of put their identity on it is it easier this year than it was when you first came in what are some things that you've noticed reflecting back from now to the first year you know really it boils down to it's it's just, the wide zone is a system to me and i think people need to understand you can't just dabble right and so i think the people that dabble are the ones that fail and so you know i think that goes to anything you know if you're an air raid guy then you better be an air raid guy right you better have the routes on air forever um, and so for me, you know, I think as the time has kind of has progressed through here at Fulcher for three years, we have progressively gotten better at a lot of things, but what we've gotten better at is finding answers for the lack of personnel that we might have in certain situations. So 
So here's a good example. Um, both my outside receivers this year ran 5-1 and 5-0-8-40s. My running back, who's my dude, ran an 11-7-1 in the 100 as a junior. He is the two-time district MVP. Um, my right tackle was my manager as a sophomore who put out cones. My right guard was a freshman who weighs 205. My center was a linebacker who weighs 210. My left guard is a JV golfer. And my left tackle played receiver as a junior. And we ran for 4,000 yards this season. What did you do to get that kind of – because I, I know a lot of coaches, and I know you've talked to a lot of them, they always say, I don't have players. Well, you just kind of – in Texas, I'm talking about Texas now. Oh, yeah. That is – to me, from South Carolina, you don't have players to compete in Texas if those were kind of your people. We what did you do? Yeah. What did you do different to make sure that you you put your kids within your still your system, yeah. put them in a good position? Because I know a lot of coaches they jump system to system to system because they're like, oh, I don't have kids for this system. I got to go to this system, and everything like that. So the first thing we do is we every year we look at it and we say, okay, hey, what is everybody else doing? We're not going to do that. We're going to do the opposite. So um, from a guy who was hell run and shoot guy for years, uh, yeah. two by two, three by one, 20 personnel um, gun, you know, I have gone from that to this year. We were 84% compressed sets. Uh, we were 96% under center. And 34% of my offense was the double tight straight T running wide zone crack toss and duo and that's it i haven't changed anything play wise give me your card give me your card i know i, know. I need to give you my run and shoot card man. <laughs> but, it, it, but i have those kids like I, the people we play are stupid athletic you know and out here you know everyone runs a 20 personnel spread you know like there's very few that run katie runs i formation and things like that but for the most part everybody wants to spread the ball out run rpos run inside zone um, you know, I see, I, I think it's finally starting to get away from it, but we saw a bunch of the old tight front, the four eyes, the quarters coverage and said, you know what? Screw it. You guys want to play with skill guys? Come play in the box with me. And so that has really changed the game for us because what we do is so different than everybody. And the next thing is, well, I'm just going to start using motions and formations and shifts and we're just going to do this to try to get leverage. So we have the old wing T philosophy of numbers and leverage, but we don't run gap scheme. And so that's kind of helped our kids. That's uh, and kind of ties into this question right here, which you said, you know, get out of that and actually yeah. do something different. What were you, what was your percentage? If you can remember off the top of your head for last year, were you more in shotgun or pistol? And if you were, what did the kids do when you were like, hey, guys, this year we're kind of going to be predominantly under center? And every, did you have any pushback or were they like, hey, we trust you, coach, because you built that culture yeah. already? So the, the, the beginning of the year, not this year, but the last season, we were predominantly well, predominantly two by two sniffer quarterback, uh, 10 personnel, um, sometimes 11 or 20. Um, but, you know, my tags and things like that, what I tell people is if you're going to stay in spread, then you need to motion and shift. Uh, it doesn't matter what you do at that point in time. Motion and shift. Everyone's built to stop RPOs now, so it's not a big deal. But everyone struggles with fast motions and shifts. Um, and so run a lot of unbalanced stuff and hurry up and you have a chance to be successful when it goes to that stuff. But what we found was we kind of told the kids, hey, this is what we're doing. And we kind of brought it in. Bro, when we introduced the double tight T, our kids got so excited. They're like, Coach, this is freaking awesome. Like, because we have ingrained in our kids that we are bullies. Like, we are physical. We are assholes. We are going to physically hurt you. That's how we beat you. And that's our philosophy. And it comes from practice. It comes from the coaches. Dude, I I'm, when I tell you, like, my coaching shirt is the NWO. Like that is our coaching shirt, NWO, New World Order, and we show our kids for life. For life, yeah, you get it. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, you know, we are Fulcher versus everybody, bro. Like we, like people talk about, you know, we're physical. No, dude. Here's how physical we are. 
I don't let people get the ball. So if we, we I don't even flip a coin half the time. I look at them, hey, do you want to defer? Yeah, I want the ball. I want the ball. Why do you want the ball? Because I'm going to go on a 10 to 15 play drive. I'm going to do everything I can to physically pound it down your throat. And I'm going to make your kids want to quit in the first quarter. Like, I don't want to score in the first four plays. I don't. I want to <laughs> physically hammer you, right? And so getting in that tee, the kids are like, coaches, we can just destroy people, right? And that's what we went with. And so you also have to remember the philosophy I had. Dude, I don't punt, right? I don't kick people. Nice. I don't kick PATs. Coach, I, I punted four times this year. Punt Good. to me is a formation. And so we punted four times. Um, if it's fourth down, we're going for it. Uh, we don't kick PATs. So we go for two. We are just demoralizing kids. And that's our goal. Our goal is to demoralize. You know, and we tell our kids, I tell my kids, you get one personal foul. It's on me. You get one personal foul. It's on me. Make it, make it worth it. Per kid or just per, like, unit? Per like. Uh, per kid. <laughs> Love that. Some kids will <laughs> some kids will take you up on it, some won't. But the ones that will, it's worth it. <laughs> I, I like <laughs> I'm glad. I have found that my kids and uh they would get demoralized before the game even started if the other team came out hyped, jumping around, mm-hmm. things like that. And I'm guessing you have too, and you found that it's a way to get in, in, get them rattled before the, the game even starts or anything like that. And then, then if you pick that up with just physically pounding them over and over again. Yes, and so like our philosophy is, bro, like, and, and we just live that life. Like our kids just have started to buy – Like our philosophy is if you are Caucasian and you're in the backfield, you have a neck roll. Old school. I'm serious. If – like we don't – we do not count pancakes. We count nut drags. You have to drag your nuts over their face. Like, we have an award called the ACL Award. Who gets the most cuts in the game at the line of scrimmage? Because y'all can cut in Texas. Only in the first two steps, just like everybody else. It's changed here. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. But that is what we do. And so, but it goes back to, bro, I roll out like, when I'm in warmups, I'm in a sleeveless hoodie. I've seen I coach. Photos. I'm out there. I'm in warmups. I run stairs for the game, and I'm sweaty, and I roll out there, and we're doing warmups. I'm in a sleeveless hoodie. And I'm just like, I don't give a F what you people think. Because you're the dirty F. Because and you're channeling that, your Bill Belichick. Well, because I, I'm, I don't care. Like, I can't, I am willing to make myself. If people think we're the bad guys, then by God, I'll be the bad guy. Because like guess that. what? The people I give a shit about. They give a shit that I like that. And they're on the team because you built that culture. That's it. I love that. All right. So you've got the wide zone and this is a good, we, we don't have to answer all of these, but let's answer the first one. What is your counter to the wide zone? So how do you like, if people are over prepared to stop that, what is something you go to be like, haha, I gotcha. Ah, uh, here we go. Counter to wide zone, uh, boot. Nice boot uh it's always boot or if they're squeezing the edge we run a bunch of crack toss okay, okay. And, um, i like that the other question i asked was um was yeah how do you run out empty quarterback run game if it's not quarterback run game we motion a lot the running back in and we actually hand it off fast as we can um pistol or under center is going to give you much better uh, downhill movement. So like pistol and, uh, and under center is you're, you're going to get better play action, better boot, and you're going to get better downhill, more physical movement. Um, and do I lock the O-line and RPO? I used to, but I don't anymore. So if I'm going to run an RPO, it's all pre-snap determined. So I just give my kid the opportunity. You can call hitch, slant, under center. He just catch, flip, throw, and nobody knows he's doing anything different. I like that. And then also you're talking about boot. Before we came on, everybody, 4,000 yards rushing. How many did you th- actually throw for? 2,800. And how was it easier for your quarterback to actually throw? Because, you know, coming from a throwing offense and you did it too, sometimes it's hard to get those kids to go through progressions and everything. Did you find the play action off of your wide zone and running the ball so much actually made your quarterback a better passer? It made it easier. So um, here's a funny story. For in, in two years, I have not run a drop back concept. 
All I've run is boot, play action, and sprint out. So our play action concepts are off of our wide zone, and they're usually two-man routes. Um, we have boot concepts, which are, is a full field flood concept, some way, shape, or form, change it up, and then we run our sprint out. Um, but, dude, when I tell you, like, my quarterback threw for 2,800 yards and 30 touchdowns, and he averaged 24 yards of completion. That is – that is nice. Okay, so let's let's work on that. Yeah. I know you you talked about the wing T kind of thing and everything like that, angles and and leverage and stuff. The wing T is known for having answers. You know, if they do this, then you do that. What is like you don't have to give away the playbook or anything. Do you, what is like the main thing you're watching in the wide zone to know, okay, I got to call this play next or or something based on what the defense is doing. If then, so for me, it's, you know, like if you bring, if your safeties are fitting, right? Safeties are fitting, it's play action. If you're squeezing the edge on me, you're not letting me get movement for width. I got to run crack toss or jet sweep. If you're bringing two guys off the back end hard and you're chasing me back from the backside, it's boot game. If you are um, blitzing, uh, for example, we have a lot of guys that like double A gap blitzes on us. Mm -hmm. um, our answer is either we're going to hit a screen or a quick screen right on the edge. Like, so we'll just catch flip throw and run and we teach our O line. It's literally a running wide zone. Just don't block the old, don't like the lead line. Don't like, like, don't block the D line, block the linebackers and safeties. Um, but that's it. I mean, like if they do this, then I do this. If they do this, then I do this. Um, but you know, when I break down film, I don't break down defensive schemes. I don't break down, uh, you know, coverages. I literally find your fish. Who's your worst D lineman, linebacker, and DB? And I'm going to try to attack them. And I try to figure out um, where you're going to put your strength. And that's pretty much all I do. Um, other than that, you have to adjust to what we do because we're so unorthodox with formations and motions and shifting and compressed sets that you really can't do a lot, right? You have to stay pretty base. Um, and when, when it boils down to it, brother, we're in the double tight straight T. You better line up and play some football, baby. <laughs> <laughs> And Tony said it best, Coach Caduti making the double tight T great again in 2024. <laughs> yes. Now, okay, getting into that, the T for people, the slot T mafia, that to me in this whole thing is actually more secretive than the run and shoot used to be. Oh, yeah. Was was this something in the in the pre or before the season started? Like, hey, I'm gonna introduce this the slot T kind of thing, or was this something in the season you're like, let's just see what this would look like, and then it had success, and you're like, let's build upon this. Hey, you better calm it down, brother. We don't run gap scheme. We are not the slot T. We are a wide zone. Um, really what it boiled down to was, man, we're so slow. Uh, athletically, we're just out-athleted, man. It's uh, hands down, bar none. doesn't matter who we play. We are out-athleted, so we have to find something we can hang our hats on. Um, you know, we played a team this year that was the entire front seven was power five. The entire front seven. You know, and <laughs> we ran for 520 yards. And it was, hey, boys, we're going to double team. We're going to try to cut here as fast as we can. And we're going to try to outnumber them. And that's about all we can do. And so, really, you know, it, it goes down to, like, hey, guys, this is how we're going to win games this year. And our kids are like, you know what? Coach, you're right. You know, this is what we need to do. And, and so what really makes us different here, and we talked about it before, was, you know, our kids. So we were top five in the state all year. And my kids had zero clue. No idea. They had no idea. They didn't care. They just want to go out and play ball. I'd say I'm going to have two kids play college football this year. Dang. I know. Okay. So, hold on. First, Bubba, thank you so much for the tip. And this dude is awesome. If you haven't already, I have some other interviews on the channel with Coach. Check him out. He drops gold the entire time. For all those coaches that are watching, thank you so much for doing this. If you find this valuable, again, please hit that like button. And if you haven't already, hit subscribe because I put out content like this all the time. It's been too long, man. It has. It it's has. All the time. I did. And for those that don't know, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I wanted to spend more time with my kids and my wife. That's why I got out of the game. I'm doing something else. But I have talked to coaches throughout the whole year and everything. And I'm getting back into it. And uh, yes, yes, I am. I am back. This is my my first time coming back in about a year and a half. And I I, I was talking to Coach Caduti, uh before this. I got the itch. 
I didn't know what to put out, but I love, I have been cyber stalking you coach the whole time because I like what you do and everything. You're, you're lucky, relationship. You're lucky you're cute. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> but I was like, Hey coach, would you like to come on and talk? And you're gracious enough to say yes. So I appreciate this. I, is there something we all, every year, there's always something that most coaches are like, Hey, let's try this. It works. Or you try a new wrinkle or something. You're like, Oh my God, I can't believe that actually worked. Did you stumble upon anything like that throughout the year? Like, Oh, this, this formation is giving defense problems or this route combination when we boot is always open. Did you find something as the year went on or was it just like, Hey, here's the game plan and it just keeps working. We're going to ride it out. You know, so that's kind of funny. You know, at the beginning of the year, we, you know, we're a base 20 personnel team, uh, base 20 personnel. And it kind of just turned into the eye ish. Next thing you know, it's, compress two by two and then it's I three by one to compress. It, it just kind of was a thing. And, but you know, what I, what I found was really fun you know, as we went through the year was we progressed and started realizing like people really struggle stopping jet sweeps under center. And then they really struggle with play action off of it. And so we started running a bunch of that off of our wide zone. And I'm telling you like that we would have got, we would have guys so open that, there's nobody within 40 yards of our, of our receivers, like nobody, because people don't at the big level in Texas, nobody runs this stuff. They want, everyone runs the base power counter 20 personnel inside zone, you know, and we're out here running double shift motion duo play action with a corner post attached to it. You know, and it's, it's very, it's very West coast ish. Right. And I'm very wordy with it because of what we have to do, but, what we found was that people really struggle. The more you compress, the more people struggle, man. And, you know, they really struggled with the double tight straight T. I mean, I, and I know it sounds really like, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? It really, it's really cliche because you, know, you hear people talk about it, like Dan Casey would post on the internet. Oh, Penn State ran the double tight straight T for two plays. Well, bitch, we line up, we line up in it in 40 plays a game sometimes. <laughs> you know, but it, it but it goes back. How do you do that, but still maintain who you are? And so we didn't run trap. We didn't run ice. We ran wide zone. We ran our version of of, of toss, where we just ran wide zone and just pin the edge. And then we ran like sometimes we would literally just run wide zone, and hit the ball to the fullback like dive, and we ran boot and do off of it. And I'm telling you, these were huge plays for us. And people just could not figure out how to stop it. And later in the year, you, you know, people start getting into it, and they, you know, they're just better than us. You know, that's we got beat by a team that was better than us, and they were well coached. And at the end of the day, kudos to them. We still had 440 yards rushing, right? And so, it's been an adventure, uh, learning what everybody else does and doing the complete opposite. So I'm sure it's going to catch up soon, and I'll be back to five wide. <laughs> I do love how. You know, for the longest time, people are like, the game of football is circular or secular. I don't know. I'm a former math teacher, not a not an English teacher. But I love how it's starting to come back. You, you said it yourself, West Coast, a lot. Shanahan, the influence and everything like that. People are getting compressed sets and stuff like that. You're in the off season. You're about, it's about to become clinic season and everything like that. What do you? What are you studying or want to get more? Hey, I want to learn more about this or. Is there anything that caught your eye that you're like, I want to dive a little bit deeper into this? All right. So there is a school in Minnesota. All right. And I've kind of been back and forth with the coach. It's uh, Elk River. Okay. And they have won a say, title a couple years ago, but all he runs is the straight team. That's all he runs. But he's a gap schemer with it. And so – I'm talking to him, trying to marry some things that he does with what I do, and he's going to do the same. We're going to start meshing this together. Um, now, Jonathan Smith at, at Oregon State, he now got the job at Michigan State. Dude, I'm in the ear, brother. I'm in the ear. I love what they do. I've talked to him a few times. You know, what he does is what we do, and I love it. And to be honest with you, there's the only reason that Oregon State won football games is because of what they did. Uh, and so – um, you know, a team, I look for teams that are way less talented that win football games against talented football teams. 
You know, for me, it doesn't do me any good to go watch Oregon. You know, I love my boy Dan, but, like, it doesn't do me any good. I ain't got Bo Nix, right? I don't have a 4-4 running back. You know, those dudes can sit there and freaking empty and just throw hitches all day and probably win most games. You know, so I got to find those teams that don't really have the kids. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, and I and I like that because I actually watched Oregon State this year. I I enjoyed that offense and everything, and I like how you find – you go out and look for teams that have less comp or less athletic players, but they're yeah. still either holding their own or actually beating programs that have better athletes, more money, and stuff like that because they do have that little nugget that you can. And use. I'm not looking for the ten and O's, the flash. Like I'm looking for the team that went seven and four. That you know they're beating teams like they won a game or two. They shouldn't have won. Why did they win that game? Why did Oregon State beat Oregon last year? Okay, what did they do? And they didn't throw the ball the entire second half? What do they do? How do they win this game? What do they do? And that's what I'm starting to get into. Like, what is – what's what? if I'm – if I ever feel like I'm on top of my game, I'm going to start failing, right? Yeah. And so that's where I am. And that's what, you know, here at Ulster, that's kind of who we are. It's our guys have to – we have to we have to out-coach people. And we have to out-physical people. And we have to – you know, we have to have an edge. And what's our edge going to be? And every year, brother, you know as well as I, man, I'm always looking for an edge. Yeah. You know, like, let's get real. Who goes for two every time? It has its own offense. Like, it's its own offense. Like, it's not even, like, normal plays. It's play one, play two, play three this week. Bro, one time, there's no lie, I got to tell this story. So, we're playing a team. And the first one, we line up, and the whole, we're in, uh, we're in the T, Okay. The whole O line starts hopping. Five moves, five guys over. Tack tight end is now the center. Snaps the ball. Quarterback runs to the right. Boots out. Center eligible. <laughs> now, was the tight end the actual tight end, or was it the center lined up at tight end? No, he was an eligible. He was our tight end. Remember, nice. they just, everyone just. Boop, boop, yeah, boop, 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 yeah. I over. love that. <laughs> but that's. I but love that. that. But guess what? I'm willing to look like a fool and act like an idiot yeah. because those kids are having fun doing this. Like our kids have fun playing football. Bro, my practices are an hour and 40 minutes max. Now we're going to get after it, and I'll run the same damn play. I'll run wide zone strong 31 times in a row until our kids get it right. But, I, you know, we don't have – we have fun. Our kids have fun. Like you don't even practice – like so our sub varsity is Thursday here in Texas, and we don't even practice Thursday afternoons. We have some varsity games. Tell our kids, man, go study hall, go to tutorials, get your stuff done, go be a kid. We don't come in on Saturdays. Coach don't come in on Saturdays. Kids don't come in on Saturdays. Just my coordinators. Um, coaches work from 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock on Sunday, man. Well, they say that. I'm here because I'm a grinder. But I don't. I want them to go spend time with their kids. Man, my kids are – dude, my daughter is passed out on the floor behind me. As you can hang on. There she is. Hey. So, but that's – my kids live in the field house and our kids, and that's kind of the idea. I want that family environment. So, you know, we're different and that makes it fun. And so that's why we do what we do. I mean, at the end of the day, if our kids stop having fun doing the stuff and we'll do something different. Coach, this, this has been amazing. Coaches, thank you so much for watching. Is there, I know you're going to be at Glazier Clinic. Where has that been finalized like which cities you're going to be at talking yeah right now right now i'm in uh, minnesota and san francisco and i think you're gonna put me on a third um okay. I'm in longview texas uh, in a week um there was a couple other places i might be at rochester uh new york uh for a little bit but i mean, i'll bounce around man just be you know, if you hit me up on my twitter or whatever i'm always game okay and coaches after this is over with uh, down below in the description, I will have all of Coach's uh, social. If you have any question, I don't want to ask him. He answers pretty yeah. much anything, as you can tell. He and, loves I have, and I have, a, and I, you know, and I have a website. website. Yep, Coach and Caduti. his website, CoachCaduti.com. Yep. Check that out. I, I mean, he's a wealth of information, as you can tell, in just this 55 minutes. And Coach, I really appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you so man. much. Mac, I missed you, brother. I missed you too, man. I'm remember, hey, you remember we used to play Madden live? Yes. Bro, we yes. had like a thousand people watching us play Madden. Yep. Talking a twist on uh, comedians 
in cars getting coffee or whatever, coaches playing Madden talking ball. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. As much flack as, as COVID had, that was the funnest I had doing all of this stuff and everything. So, oh, we had a blast. And we did so much stuff together. Yes. And it was awesome. We were like best friends. Yeah. <laughs> I need to come in clinic again just to, to come to Houston around there again. What are you doing, man? Come on. Okay. Uh, we will do that. Coaches, again, if you found any value in this, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, all that stuff. And I'm back, so stay tuned. I will talk to you all later.